السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عباد الله brothers and sisters first of all I want to thank you uh, for taking your time to spend some time with me here online um, الحمد لله we're, we're uh, in the last days of Ramadan this is the 25th today so this is live the the month uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ayyam and ma'dudat that these are ayyam in Arabic is ala was an af'al it's called jam'u qilla it's a it's a plural of pausity in other words these are few days so if it feels like they went fast they intentionally uh, are there uh, to to do just that because this is an opportunity that we're being told not to squander it's an opportunity of time in our tradition, we have the concept of baraka, which is, in Arabic, the word actually means to descend. So you have a, a camel, barakat al naqatu like the camel uh, alighted, uh, descended on something. And so baraka is something that, uh, rain is called baraka. It's something that uh, it, it descends. And so in, in, I think the closest equivalent in the Western tradition is the idea of grace. Um, that you bless things, you, people say grace before their meal, that's to, to, to add in that barakah. And so in our tradition we have, we have barakah that inheres in time, we have barakah that inheres in space, and we have barakah that inheres in people. And so the barakah of, of, of time, um, for instance, there's an hour every day that is an hour of istijaba. And Allah hides these things. It's one of the things that He hides uh, in in His um, in in time, so that we pursue it fervently. They tahari is to really fervently seek something, uh, to seek it out. And so, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has hidden that time that of barakah, of immense barakah in the day, and then. Uh, Monday has a blessing and Thursday has a blessing. The Prophet was asked about fasting on Monday. He said, Fihi wudid tu, on that day I was born. In other words, it's a day of blessing because of the fact that he was born in it, gives it an added blessing or barakah. And the same is true for um, Thursdays because Mondays and Thursdays are the times when the, the actions, uh, uh, the angels uh, take the actions of the servant. And so, when you're fasting, they're taken in a, in a state of incredible obedience because fasting is one of the most rigorous types of obedience that we do. And then you have the, the idea of, of Juma, which is uh, extra barakah on Friday. And then the, the barakah of uh, the mawasim or the seasons. So for instance, the Hajj is an immense time of barakah. Uh, and then you have barakah in uh, Ramadan. You have barakah also According to some, not everybody agrees about this, um, Imam Madik differed, but the people of Sham, the Nus Sha'ban, what they call Shabi Barat, uh, is considered to be a night of Barakah. And there is a Khilaf, so when you see people say, oh, I don't celebrate that, that's fine, they don't have to celebrate it, and, and, and those opinions stand. But the majority of scholars have seen it as a blessed night, and that's why in most places, especially in South Asia, that they have their own term for it, Shabi Barat. It's, it's a very important night for them. So it's, these are times when there's a, an immense amount of Barakah. And so again, uh, you have Barakah also in years. Um, and the 17th of Ramadan is uh, a day of Barakah because it's the day of Badr. And traditionally Muslims would do the Badriya. So, this period that we have, these last 10 days, are considered to be an intense period of, of, of blessing. And it's difficult to translate the, the word Laylatul Qadr. Uh, it's, it's often translated as the night of power, but it's actually the night of decrees. It's the night in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yuqaddiru. And that's, that's the dominant opinion, that it's called Laylatul Qadr because Allah determines what is going to happen uh, in that uh, coming year. And there's a lot of difference of opinion about when it is. In fact, some of the scholars actually argued that it was at any time uh, during the year. 
And for that reason, they said that really, that the people of highest himma, they consider every night to be possibly a night of Qadr. And, um, but the, the, the common understanding is it's a night of power. In other words, it's a powerful night, which that is certainly true. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about power and the, and the, and the secret of powerlessness. In our tradition, Qudra, uh, Allah is Al-Qadr, He's Al-Muqtadr, He's Al-Qadir. There are many words uh, used to describe the different aspects of Allah's power, that Allah has absolute power. We, on the other hand, have power that is granted to us. And there's differences of opinion about whether that power inheres in us or is it something that is purely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all we earn is the, um, is the action itself through kisab. These are what they call daqiq al-kalam, the, the, the particulars of kalam. And I was speaking uh, last night with um, the great scholar Sheikh Saleh al Ghursi, he's really one of the great scholars of, uh, of Ilm al Kalam. We were actually talking about this issue. He, he called me from uh, Turkey, and, uh, and I, because one of our students actually did a paper on this. So, the idea of, of power, of human beings having power, we actually, in the end, we express our powerlessness by saying, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. There is no power. There is no strength to حول like you حول to make any changes or to actually uh, affect anything. There is no strength or power except بالله through the means, the divine enablement. This is the istita that Imam Al Tahawi mentions in his book that he grants us. And so it's very important for us not to see power even in the world to see nations with power they there's actually they don't have power in reality and the people that understand this are actually they're 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 the freest people because they're, they're not afraid they're not afraid of people that are in power they're not afraid i mean obviously we behave with the asbab so we're not foolish people in that way the the prophet sallallahu said al mu'minu la yudhillu nafsa that a believer should never humiliate himself. And so uh, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq and others uh, mentioned that they should not ever put themselves in situations where they will be humiliated. And Ahmed Zarruq said, لا يتعرضوا للسلطان that they don't oppose government uh, in a way that the government will in turn uh, humiliate them, uh, put them in jail and do these things. He said that was a type of idhlal. Uh, that, that, uh, that they did. Uh, and in fact, in the famous hadith about the highest shaheed, uh, which is the, the man who goes to unjust power and, and speaks the truth and is executed for it, Ahmed al Muhammad radiallahu actually said that, um, that he shouldn't go knowingly that he's going to do that, that if that happens, that's a shahada, but he shouldn't put himself in that type of position. These are, again, uh, khilaf issues, but, but the important point that I really want to drive home is that powerlessness is our state. It is the actual natural state of the servant of Allah. We are abd. And the, the thing about the abd, the, the abd is ajiz. He's, he or she is powerless. It's the abd and the amma, that they are they only they do what they're told by their mawla which again doesn't mean that we don't do things we choose things in the world we do all these things but we live with this alignment with the divine in other words we restrict ourselves to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted us to do and in that way we in a sense are handing over uh, that freedom and in doing that by, by, by entering into Islam by entering into a state of submission we actually become free uh, so there's a, an immense power in powerlessness and there's an immense freedom in powerlessness. And this is something that the early Muslims really understood well. They, they, they understood this in a very deep and powerful way. Um, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, طوبى لمن تواضع في غير من قصى طوبى لمن تواضع في غير من قصى طوبى, some of the uh, commentaries say that طوبى is a tree in paradise. There are many hadiths that use this term, tuba. It, it also can mean blessed are the people, but, but uh, some say it's actually a tree with immense shade and fruit in paradise that 
uh, that will be for the people who do these things. So he said, من توابع في غير منقصة who humbles him or herself without manqasa, without, there's no deficiency in them. In other words, like a wealthy person that's humble despite his wealth, an intellectual, uh, highly educated person who's humble despite their education and their understanding. Th that's what it means to be humble. And it's something that we have to struggle with. Uh, it, there, there's, there's, a, there's a type of Tawadu, if you actually look at the, the, the morphological form of it, it actually has to do with like you actually do it with a knowledge that you need to be humble. Uh, because in the end, al kibriya lillah, al azamatu lillah, wal kibriya lillah, that, that magnanim, the, the vastness, the greatness, the grandeur, uh, the glory, and the majesty, all of these are attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not attributes of a servant. And so the servant should be humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the Prophet said, Man lillah, rafa'ahu Allah. Whoever is humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will elevate that person. And this is something that we have to learn as an ummah, that uh, in, in, in many ways, uh, we, 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 we tend to forget this important metaphysical truth, that Allah will, will elevate the people who are humble. لا يريدون علوم في الأرض ولا فسادا. Those who don't want to be exalted in the earth, they don't want it. لا يريدون علوم في الأرض ولا فسادا. And that wow there indicates that these are two separate things. They don't want to be elevated in the earth. فرعون الله says على في الأرض على فرعون. He 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 exalted himself. He puffed himself up in the earth. And so it's very important that Muslims should not want to be in those positions of power or authority, to be, no. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever seeks positions of authority or power, uh, they should not be given them. There goes elections. So, so it's very important that we remember that Allah is the one that you mekkin, that he's the one that gives tamkeen, but he gives tamkeen with conditions for the people he loves, he'll give tamkeen. What do they do? You know, they, they establish prayer. They, they pay their zakat. They fulfill the obligations of being in that position. If they don't have that ability, if Allah loves them, he will not give them, uh, he will not establish them in the earth. And so powerlessness is a, an incredible sunnah that I believe it's actually a sunnah mansiyah. It's a forgotten sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu He, before, even when he was forced into jihad, and, and it's very clear, Ibn Taymiyyah makes this clear, and many scholars, and if you haven't read Wang Cole's book, uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, A Prophet of Peace Amidst a, a Class of Civilizations, it's an stunning book. I mean, I, I, I recently read it, and I actually had a, uh, a meeting with the author, and, and I was just so impressed with how he showed that clearly that the Prophet ﷺ not only was far from a warmonger, which we know, that he really was constantly looking for avenues of peace. The Prophet ﷺ always wanted to find an avenue of peace. In the 29 uh, battles, they're called battles, they're not battles, Ghazawat are military expeditions. They're not battles, but they're often translated as battles. It's a mistake. Because in those 29, there, there's again difference of opinion, 27, 29, but in those 29 battles, fighting only occurred in 11. And in the greatest battle in terms of numbers, which was the Khandaq, less than 10 people died. And there were tens of thousands of people involved in that, 3,000. On the Muslim side, 30,000, it was 10 to 1 numbers. The, despite that, less than 10 people died. And when I did a study of the number of people that died during the Prophet's lifetime, we're looking at less than 400 people. It's, it's quite stunning. And the Bani Qurayza, which is clearly an exaggerated number, and the, the, uh, the book that uh, uh, Barakat Ahmed wrote, uh, Muhammad and the Jews, is, I think, a really important book um, that, that really shows that the numbers were grossly exaggerated. Uh, much later. So, so this idea of طوبة لمن تواضع في غير من قصة وذل في نفسه من غير مسألة and he, he ذل في نفسه he, in his own self he, he deems himself insignificant and this is another really important quality 
is to recognize not only are we all expendable, as de Gaulle said, that the graveyard is filled with indispensable people. That, I mean, one of the things about life is that when you die, most people are just going to, oh, you know, if they knew you, they might say, oh, mashallah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. If they were close, they might send condolences to the family. And think, but the people that are really going to miss you are your direct loved ones. Those are the people that are going to miss you. Other people won't really miss you. The, the world goes on. And we've lost greats. When Ibn Manjur died, who was one of the greatest scholars of Morocco, the man who buried him, who was his student, wept and just said, I knew this world was insignificant when, when a man that had this tongue, because he taught his whole life and, and he was just a master of all the sciences, one of the truly great faqis of, of Moroccan history. And he said, I just knew that if worms could eat this tongue, this earth, was wor th th this earth had such insignificance in my eyes. And, and this is the nature of dunya. We're passing through it. It's important, and we're people that love the alam because it's Allah's creation, but we, we despise the dunya. And the, the distinction between those two is very important, between alam and between dunya. Alam is this incredible theophany. It's this, it's this amazing theater of enlightenment. It's this incredible manifestation of divine attributes. Uh, the actions of God, the af'al of God, it's stunning with, with its stars in the heavens, all of these galaxies, this extraordinary sky, uh, the blueness uh, of the sky and its reflection in the ocean, uh, the wonders of the sea, the incredible uh, spectrum of flora and fauna on this planet. We're all, now we're living in a time where we're discovering all these micronutrients and all these amazing foods from all over the world. These, these, that aspect of the world is something to just marvel at and to feel joy just about being in it. But the dunya is reputation. It's, uh, you know, he said, she said. Uh, King Lear, there's a wonderful scene at the end of King Lear where he tells Cordelia, you know, about how we're going to be free now from who's in and who's out at the court. You know, we can live life now without having to worry about, uh, because he has a realization, an incredible realization in that play. This is part of dunya. As you get older, you will see more and more how empty and vacuous the life of this world is. Hayatul dunya. Mata'un, mata'ul ghurur. It's a delusional pleasure. Mata'ul ghurur. That's all it is. It's a delusional pleasure. I've been with the poorest people on the planet, and I've been with the richest people on the planet. I've, I've seen the inside of palaces, and I've, I've lived in the huts of some of the poorest people on the planet. And uh, some of the most extraordinary people I've ever met are, are the poorest people that I've met. And um, so, I, you know, this is dunya. We, have to, we, we just have to understand the nature of the abode and what it is. Uh, and, and, and so you have this sense of your own insignificance. One of my favorite stories of all the stories in the Sirah, which is in a Sahih collection also, Aisha, the beloved wife of the Prophet when she, when, when she was slandered so uh, horribly, when she found out about it, she, she, her hair fell out, she stopped eating, she, she went into a horrible uh, depression. Uh, for a period of time. And then, and then the revelation came. But she said, Kuntu I, I, I deemed myself insignificant. She said, I knew Allah would absolve me of this, um, of this slander, but I just deemed myself insignificant that any revelation would come. That, that's what this is about. Like beggars, just by begging, you know, ذَلَّ But uh, it's saying without b being in a state of need, you have this insignificant view of yourself. And this is something really important. I mean, so many people just take themselves far too seriously and, the, and their own significance. And, um, and it just creates ego. It creates a sense of... Um, of um, uh, just an inflated sense of self. 
And, and there's, uh, there's nothing worse than a puffed up soul. Uh, I mean, one of the things in, 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 in the Western tradition, they have this idea of kenosis, of the emptying out of the soul. And we have the idea of takhliya. It's, it's the same concept. The idea takhliya. You empty your soul of yourself. I mean, there's a beautiful Egyptian expression for the Egyptians out there. There's a beautiful Egyptian expression that, that I, th- I thought about because I always thought it was so, such a strange way of... The Egyptians, like in, in, in Mexico, you have idioms. Like in, in, in Spanish, they say, pongasi mastrucha, you know, like watch out, which if you actually literally translate it, it seems strange. But in, in Egypt, when they say watch out, they say, khalli balak min nafsik. Khalli balak min nafsik just means watch out. You know, you know, watch out. But what it literally means is empty your mind of yourself. That's how you watch out. Because if you empty your mind of yourself, if you, if you, Allah will watch out for you. Uh, it's, it must have come from, uh, from some enlightened people in Egypt that just started that phrase because it's a beautiful phrase <laughs> empty your mind of yourself and one of the Moroccan great Moroccan sages Sidi Ali al-Jamal he said <laughs> set your mind at ease and learn how to swim set your mind at ease and learn how to swim the world is in good hands. No matter what you see out there of trial and tribulation, it's all from what we, our own hands have wrought. All of it. There's nothing out there that we haven't caused ourselves. People say, where is God? Somebody actually said to that, that to me recently. Somebody from one of these countries is going through immense tribulation. They said, where is God? And I just said, I think God's question to us is, where are you? And, and that is a perfectly valid question from God. It's not a valid question from us. La yusaru amma yafal wa hum yusadun. God is not asked about what He does, but they will be asked about what they do. And so that's a different way of looking at it. So just remembering that power is Allah's alone. Allahumma mal, Allahumma malik al mulk, tuat al mulk man tasha. O O Allah, possessor of dominion. You give dominion to whom you please. You give it to whom you please. You dignify whom you please and you humiliate or abase whom you please. This is, this is, uh, this is it. Uh, right? this, this is the reality. So it's very important to remember that. And then... وَأَنْفَقَ مَالًا جَمَعَهُ فِي غَيْرِ مَعْصِيَةً And they expend wealth that they have gathered or earned without any disobedience. إِنَّ اللَّهَ طَيِّبٌ وَلَا يَقْبَرُ إِلَّا طَيِّبًا Allah is pure and He only accepts pure things. وَرَحِمُ اللَّهُ أَهْلَ الذُّلِّ وَالْمَسْكَنَةً And God will have mercy on humble people and the poor people. Uh, Allah loves the poor. Poor in spirit, uh, not necessarily poor in... Uh, in, um, in wealth because there are many good wealthy people and we don't, uh, we don't have the tradition that wealth is somehow uh, evil or something to avoid. No, some of the people that, that had the highest maqams in our early Islam around the Prophet ﷺ were extremely wealthy people but they used their wealth for good and the Prophet ﷺ said two people will never, uh, will never uh, go, uh, two people are envied. Uh, the one who's given wisdom and, and teaches, and the one who's given wealth and expends it fi by night and by day. So th- those, those are the two things that we should want in the world, is either wealth to do good things with, or wisdom to act according to and to help others to act according to. So I just want to look quickly, and then, and then we'll open up for some questions. Um, I want to look quickly at, uh, at Surat Al-Qadr. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is from Imam al-Baghawi, one of the great uh, commentators of Quran, great Shafi'i scholar. Inna anzalnahu fi laylat al-Qadr. Ya'ni al-Quran. It means the Quran. Kinayatan an ghayri madhkur. So it's, a, it's, it's basically uh, taking the place of what's not mentioned. So the damir there, the personal pronoun, hu, inna anzalnahu, goes back to the Quran. 
أنه أنزره جملة واحدة في ليلة القدر من اللوح المحفوظ إلى السماء الدنيا So Allah revealed it at one time So it all came down to uh, سماء الدنيا one time the Quran and then it's, it was revealed uh, by over time over a 20 year period uh, th- uh, from there so so wada'ahu fi bayt al izza so this is a the 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 bait the, the 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 house that is over the kaaba it was it was placed there thumma can it ينزل به جبريل عليه السلام and this is why أنزلناه in the Quran you have أنزل and نزل أنزل means to come down all at once نزل means ينزله to come down uh, pieces so both happened and then it says وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر and this is this is عجب نبيه so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it's to make you think, wow, what is this? And what will convey to you what Laylat al-Qadr is? And, and, and so, سميت Laylat al-Qadr لأنها ليلة تقدير الأمور والأحكام يقدر الله فيها أمر السنة في عباده وبلاده إلى السنة المقبرة So this is the reason Imam al-Baghawi says, and this was the tafsir that was studied by all students of knowledge uh, after it was written. Uh, Imam al-Baghawi and al-Baydawi became the two most important tafsirs for students of knowledge. Um, so he says that, that it was what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> decrees for the following year, excuse me, uh, for his servants and for the land. So for instance, w- the wars that are going to be determined, all these things, uh, the, the, the droughts, the famines, the blessings, everything. And this is why you want to be in the most... Uh, obedient state and you want to be really calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's a time where you have to be aligned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the Prophet sallallahu said to seek it out in these last 10 nights especially in the odd nights but it's something that we should also take that advice and think about uh, these things every every year and then he says and they differ about its actual time that it, it was only during the time of the prophet and then it was removed that's one opinion so, but the majority of Sahaba and the scholars say no, it continues until the day of judgment. It's any night during the, the nights of the year. But the majority of scholars say that it's in the month of Ramadan. Hassan. Laylatu Saba'ashara. It's the night of the of, of the twenty uh, of the seventeenth. Wahiya Layla Latikanat Sabihataha Wakata Bedrin. And it's the night that Kanat Sabihatuha Wakata Bedrin. That its its morning was on the the day of Badr. Uh, and so was Sahih Waladi Adir Akharun. But the sound opinion and what the majority say, Annaha Fir Ashara al Awakhir fi Shahri Ramadan. أبهم الله هذه الليلة على هذه الأمة ليشتهدوا في العبادة ليالي رمضان طمعا في إدراكها كما أخفى سعة الإجابة في يوم الجمعة وأخفى الصلاة الوسطى في الصروات الخمس واسمه الأعظم واسمه الأعظم في الأسماء. So this is amazing. So he said, Allah has hidden this night uh, from his ummah in order that they strive hard to uh, to find it with their worship uh, through the nights of Ramadan, desiring to to actually achieve this night because it's worth a thousand uh, months, and so and 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 like that, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has hid the hour of ijaba in, in, on the day of Jumaa. He also has hid the the wusta prayer. Some say it's Asr. Imam Malik said it was Fajr, but he's hid the the middle prayer in the five prayers. He's hid his Isma Al-Azam in his names. Some say it's Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum. Some say it's Ya Allah. Uh, so, so there's different opinions about that, but we don't know. وَرِضَاهُ فِي الطَّاعَاتِ لِيَرْغَبُوا فِي جَمِيعِهَا And then he put his rida, his pleasure or his contentment, in his devotional practices. So we don't know what devotion we do is 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 going to achieve the rida of Allah. 
that we know that the prostitute was forgiven for feeding a dog who was thirsty or star, uh, starving. And so, and he hid also, and he also hid his wrath in acts of disobedience so that we would avoid all of them. And then he also hid that the, the time of, of the, the last hour so that we would always be prepared for it. And then he says, Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shahar ma'anahu amrun salihun fi Laylatul Qadri khayrun min amri alf shaharin laysa fiha Laylatul Qadr. So it's worth, the actions of your worship on that, on this night are worth a thousand months. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, tanazzalul mala'ikatu wa ruhu so the angels come down and the Ruh, the Holy Spirit, we know uh, uh, in our tradition, the Holy Spirit is not a persona of God, uh, as some Christians believe, but the Holy Spirit is Jibreel, السلام, he's called Ruh al-Qudus, the Holy Spirit. And the Prophet believed in the Holy Spirit and uh, he said to Hassan ibn Thabit, ayyadik Allah bi Ruh al-Qudus, may the Holy Spirit uh, give you um, a succor or uh, help. So, uh, so the, the, it's a time when the Holy Spirit comes down. Uh, so, uh, in other words, of khair and baraka. So, yahfadun min amri Allah, ay bi amri Allah. Salam. Ata said, "Yuridu salam ala awliya illa wa ahli taatihi." One of the things in in uh, in if you know if you have uh, Christian friends. And they might send you a holiday card, and they and they quote a, a, a verse from the Bible that says, you know, uh, uh, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Uh, it, it actually doesn't say that. If you look at the in the in the Greek, it says goodwill towards righteous men. Um, and and this is something also uh, in the Tao Te Ching. Uh, it says uh, all men hate arms. You know, like violence. Uh, Thomas Cleary told me it actually doesn't say that in Chinese. It says good men, good men don't like that. So one of the things that we have to remember is that there are shayateen al-ins out there. There's just, there's, there's, so the salam is not for everybody. It's for the people of, of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're the ones that get the peace. Uh, Imam Sha'bi said that it was that the angels are greeting the people in the masjids on Laylat al-Qadr, which is why everybody goes. From the time the sun goes, uh, disappears until Fajr appears. So he said that that the angels greet every believer, man and woman, on that day. That's what Imam al-Kalbi said. Now, in the, in, the, in the actual verse, it says, Hiya hatta matla'i al-fajr. And in, in Arabic, hatta has three different meanings, but, but uh, in Arabic, it's usually what's called a, a preposition, harf jar, that what follows it is majroor. Uh, but it can also be a type of uh, varf. So, so in, if it goes like he hatta matla al fajr and it's mansub, then it means including uh, fajr. Uh, if, like if you say akeltu as samaka hatta rasaha, I ate the fish, even the head. Whereas if you said akeltu samaka hatta rasiha, then it's up to to that point. And so here it stops at that point. So the night is the night, and once the day comes, once the day breaks then the, the night of power is over. Even though that day, uh, according to the ulama, is a good day to also have ishtihad. Uh, and Mujahid said, يعني أن ليلة القدر سالمة لا يستطيع الشيطان أن يعمل فيها سوء ولا أن يحدث فيها يحدث أن يحدث فيها أذن. So it's the time when shaitan can't do any su and nor can he cause any harm. Uh, until so alhamdulillah maybe there's uh, some comments or uh, 
uh, questions um, that anybody has. Um, may Allah bless you. Uh, and, I, and I would just request uh, for those of you uh, who uh, are, are supporters of Zaytuna College, I really thank you for your support. For those of you who are not, uh, I really hope that you might think about even uh, the 12,000 strong. We have a campaign of 12,000 strong. Uh, we had an extraordinary commencement this year with some really great students. We've got uh, 23 students coming in uh, in, the, in the next class. Um, so uh, alhamdulillah, we have a master's program uh, here. Um, we're, we're going to be um, also uh, have, uh, having a, a launch for a new website uh, fairly soon. So uh, we're excited about things that are happening, and uh, we have really wonderful... Um, new academic, chief academic officer, Dr. Omar Qureshi, he's been fantastic. Uh, we have really a lot of really sincere and hardworking people. And um, so we really uh, hope that you'll uh, consider supporting us and uh, so we can uh, do more for this community and for our ummah. The, the ummah's fallen on hard times, but inshallah, there are good times, there are times, and there's always blessings in the midst of all the tribulations. Thank you for that, Sheikh Hamza. May Allah reward you. Amen. And inshallah, I will ask a few questions from online. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of people commenting prayers for yourself, your family, and Zaytuna. Thank you. And the work we're doing. And thanks for your Ramadan rumination series. And the first question we have from Facebook is from Yasmina, who asks, what is the best way to counter our nafs? Big question, Mukharafat al nafs. You have four enemies in this life, and only four. Uh, nafs, shaitan, hawa, and dunya. All the other enemies, uh, you, if Allah sends them to you, it's a tribulation. But your real enemies are these four. And if, if you can conquer these four enemies, all the other enemies are very uh, insignificant. But the nafs is the number one. The Prophet ﷺ said, the, the most uh, vicious enemy that you have, the most harmful enemy that you have, the most aggressive enemy that you have is your own ego between your two sides. And we all have them. We're, we're, we're born with them. Children, children have wonderful, beautiful side, but then they've got that uh, horrible, childish, selfish side. It's mine. You know, when they grab a toy, it's mine. So this, this is something that as you grow older, hopefully you, you learn to overcome that. But there are many people that behave like infants uh, throughout their whole lives. So one of the most important things that we can do is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, just to remember Allah, to work on ourselves. We have to work on ourselves. I mean, we all struggle. I struggle with myself. We have to work on ourselves. We, we can always do better. Um, I, was, I was today, just today, I was in a, uh, you know, I had a, a meeting with some people that came. They were nice people, you know. And, and I was, I just really, because I was really busy with something else and I had some problems, I just, I, I didn't, I felt like, you know, I really wasn't, uh, I was rude, basically, to somebody. And I, and I immediately, like, after the meeting, I went up to her and I just said, I want you to please... I apologize. You know, I, I, I don't think I, I listened to you attentively, uh, and, that, and that was my mistake. And I think being able just to ad admit that you're wrong about things is really important, not being defensive. Um, the ego always defends itself. Um, in fact, one of the most extraordinary scholars, uh, Ibrahim al laqani is an amazing man. If you study his life, you just marvel. Um, he actually wrote the Johara in one night. And when he finished it, he went to his sheikh and he gave it to him. And his sheikh knew what it meant, like he had had an opening, because it's a stunning uh, poem, um, 144 lines of just crisp uh, 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 creed. And he, he took an oath with him. He said, from this day forward, I never want you to defend yourself. And that's a, that's a powerful practice of just not defending yourself. We have an amazing story of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu when a man was really abusing him in front of the Prophet and the Prophet was there listening and, 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 and smiling and then Abu Bakr just couldn't take it anymore. 
So now his nafs came in, and even Abu Bakr had uh, a nafs. I mean, it's the purest of all nafs after our Prophet ﷺ in, in, in his ummah. But he, he, he couldn't take it anymore. He started defending himself. The Prophet left. When he saw him later, he asked him why he left. He said, that man, was, it wasn't true what he was saying. He said, I saw the, the angels defending you. And right when you began to defend yourself, shaitan came into the room. And I don't sit with shaitan. I mean, that, that is just such a stunning testimony to the power of fighting the ego. Um, so what I, what, I, what I would suggest, f first and foremost, is that, that you, you, you begin to do a type of muhasaba. And we actually, Imam Zaid and I worked on something together um, called the Agenda for Changing Our Condition. And it's actually a, a program to work on the self where you, you do a musharata, uh, you know, and then muraqaba, and then muhasaba, and then muaqaba. So you do, you, you, you actually commit like I'm not gonna backbite, and you commit to doing it for 40 days, 40 days straight, because it takes 40 days to really get the, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave arba'ina layla, like he gave 40, to, to prepare for the meeting, he gave Moses 40 nights to prepare. And so 40, this is why in Jama'at Tabliq they go out for 40 days. There's a big secret in the number 40. And so uh, you do 40 days of, not, I'm not going to backbite for 40 days. And if you do, you have to do muhasab at the end of the day. And then you start over if you didn't do it. And then you do a mu'aqaba. You, you have to punish yourself. Ibn Wahbin said, I made many oaths to give up um, backbiting and I ended up fasting a lot because he would break the oath. He'd do another and then he'd have to fast. And he said, so I decided that I would give a dinar in charity every time I, I spoke ill of someone. And he said, because of my love for money, I was able to finally give up um, because he, he, he made that his oath instead of fasting, breaking his oath. So um, I think that's something that you can practice, is just working on things. One of the things most of us in, in, in an insana, uh, you know, out of nafsi basir, the human being knows his own soul. Walo alqa ma'adira. Even if he gives his excuses, he knows his own soul. And so I think most of us know what's wrong. It's very good to ask people. I mean, I, I always get shocked sometimes. I'll ask, um, do I do this or do I do that? And I say, yes, you do. You know, that, that's an ouch. But it's something that you have to, uh, to take reflection from other people. So that, that's important. And then the, the best thing, and this, this is absolutely well established, is prayer on the Prophet's life. If you make it a consistent practice, uh, you, your soul will, will align. And, and this is something witnessed by many, many people. So people that do consistent practice of uh, prayer on the Prophet uh, that, that it has an effect on the heart and they really begin to behave uh, in a much better way. But each of us have our trials and tribulations. Uh, it's also useful to know what's, what's called the temporal, uh, the humoral theory. So if, if, and this is something Imam al-Ghazali said that you really shouldn't be a teacher unless you've studied this. Um, so you should know, uh, it's similar to the Briggs-Meyer type uh, uh, personality uh, test. Um, so it's, very, it's actually very similar. And Jung also came up with, with a similar model. But the humoral theory is what the Muslims used. It was developed by, uh, it, it originally comes from uh, Hippocrates and then Galen, but the one who developed it uh, extensively was uh, Ibn Sina, the physician. So you, knowing what humor you have is really important. Are you phlegmatic? Are you choleric? Are you sanguine? Are you melancholic? So this is Demawi, Balagami, Saudawi, Safrawi. Knowing those, uh, and then there are also mixtures of two, like my, 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 my baseline is Demawi, but my uh, my layered on is Safrawi. A lot of people that are uh, uh, that like reading and studying and scholarly by nature tend to be Safrawi. And Safrawi is, is a tough disposition. People that are melancholic Safrawi have a really hard time. So it just depends on what God's given you. 
People that are sanguine tend to be very cheery, but each one of them comes with their shortcomings and their blessings. So knowing that can help because um, if there's, a, there's an interesting book called The Temperament God Gave You, uh, which uh, it's a Catholic book, but it really, it has a test. You can take the test. It'll really help you to see what things you, you, you're naturally going to need to work on. And, and I, I swear by the, the temperament uh, tradition. I really believe it's very accurate. Thank you for that. We'll take a question from our live stream channel. Could you ask Sheikh Hamza if someone doesn't understand the Quran recitation during Tarawih, but rather spends that time studying the Quran, is there a similar reward? That, that's a really good question. Um, first of all, I want to say something uh, about Tarawih. Traditionally, in most Muslim countries, Tarawih was actually done uh, relatively short. Uh, doing a khatam in Tarawih was not the tradition in, in most places. There were certain mosques that did khatam for people that wanted to. Unfortunately now, like if you go to Turkey, most of the mosques do very short, 20 short rakats. And I really think that we need to revive this sunnah because a lot more people would come for tarawih. A lot of people leave after eight. Sometimes tarawih ends now at like 12 o'clock, 11.30. People have to work. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, yasiru wa la tu'asiru. Make things easy for people, make, don't make them difficult. I love the, the, the Indian and Pakistani community is amazing. Like you see these people that just, mashallah, it's really quite stunning how they, um, I mean, I've been to, in the Muslim world, in some of the Muslim countries I've lived in, I've been to mosques where it's like, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Arif Lam Mim, Allahu Akbar, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ha Mim, Allahu Akbar. I mean, I've literally seen that. And then I've seen middle, and then I've seen the, the khatam. So I think it's important uh, in the Maliki tradition, which is the school that I studied, it's actually preferred to do it in your home if you're able to do it in your home. So uh, if you're, if you're going to be lazy, then it's, it's better to go to the masjid. But um, it's, it's better to do it. Especially um, people have, uh, we don't have moss on every corner like many Muslim countries. Now in terms of the question, Qiyam is, is, is one of the sunnah of Ramadan. And I would never leave a sunnah. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's nothing, there's no better dhikr than the Quran. Afdalu dhikrillah. It's kitabullah. It's ma sadra minhu wa raja'i ilayhi. That's the best dhikr that you can do. I mean, afdaru ma qudtu, the best thing that anybody ever said, I said, or any prophet said, is la ilaha illallah. But la ilaha illallah is also Quran. So, but in, in the Fajr time and in the Maghrib time, the best dhikr at that time is the adhkar al-sabah wal masa al-baqiyat al-salihat, and things that the Prophet did at that time. It's better to do those because it's the sunnah to do those at that time. And following the Prophet is very important to do what he did. And so you should do some qiyam. Even if you just do uh, you know, some short rakats in your own home, you should do some qiyam. Um, if you find it difficult, it's not meant to be difficult. We didn't reveal this Quran that you're miserable. So the, the, the understanding is uh, to, to be joyful and happy. Um, Tarawih is undeniably uh, uh, for most people. I'm not going to say for everybody because I don't know. But for most people, it's going to be a richer experience if you can actually understand the Quran. It's even better if you memorize. So the parts that some, so if, if you memorize certain parts and you hear them recited, it's much more because you can really follow them. So I think that definitely has a, an, an aspect. But I would say study the Quran in Ramadan, but also do Qiyam. Um, even, even if you can't do the 20 rakats, if it's difficult for you, just do some short rakats in your own home, but do some Qiyam. Barakallahu feek. We have a somewhat related question from Facebook. For an ill person who couldn't fast during this Ramadan, what is the right practice to adopt? 
pay the fidya and fast 30 days when they feel better before the next Ramadan, or just pay the fidya and it is not mandatory to fast 30 days prior to the next Ramadan. I feel very confused, so thanks for enlightening us if you can. Ramadan Kareem. If, if, you, if, you, if you can fast later in the year, you have to fast. The fidya is for people that can't fast. So you might be pregnant or nursing or something like that. It's going to harm you. But when you're able to, you make up the fast. Uh, fidya is for like old people or people that have diabetes or people that their, their physicians told them they can't fast. I know of somebody who was, went into pretty serious um, tachycardia because of fasting, that type of person, and, and it's, it's happened in more than one Ramadan, that person should not fast. And the doctor will tell them that. And if the doctor tells you not to fast, if, if, it, if, it's, if, if it's if a valid doctor with an MD and they're telling you it is medically dangerous for you to fast, you should not fast. The other thing, and, and this is my firm conviction, little children should not fast. I know there's a khilaf about this. Imam Malik who said that it was ta'dib, that it was actually torture for children. I know there's little children that want to fast because they see everybody fasting. If, if they're going to do that, you should only do like half day. <clears throat> but they should, their, their brains are developing. They need glucose. They need uh, energy. They need caloric energy. It's, not he it's healthy for us to actually fast. It's not healthy for them to fast when they're young. And I know there's hadith in the Sahih collection and things, but that was not the practice of the people of Medina. Um, and Malik had 600 uh, teachers from the Tabi'een. And that was his opinion. It's a strong opinion. And I think as somebody who studied, um, uh, who has some medical background, uh, and I think if you ask most doctors, they would tell you, the science is in, and it's not good for children to fast long periods of time. So um, the fidya is permitted. Uh, if you allow a year to go by, you, you have to do, feed uh, a, a poor person for each day you allow to, to, for a year to elapse before you made up that fast. So in Ramadan, it's better to try to make it up early. If you did let the year go by, um, and you ha when you finish Ramadan, you can actually, according to some opinions, you could do the six days of shawal and make the niya of making up fasting. Inshallah, you get the reward for both. I mean, th these are khilaf issues, but rahmatullah wa asi'ah, Allah's mercy is vast. So um, that, I think that, that answers that question, inshallah. Barakallah, Fiq. Okay, we'll just take a couple more, more and, questions. And wrap it up, if you don't mind. Okay. Good question here. Um, may Allah reward you for this talk and your Ramadan ruminations. Any general advice about the role the Quran should play in our lives? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I think the, the, the Prophet said towards these latter days to, to just go back to the Book of Allah. I think the Quran is... It's, it's an amazing uh, experience to have a serious relationship with the Qur'an. I think study is important. Um, but recitation of Qur'an, obviously, if, the more you understand, the, the, the more interesting uh, it is just in terms of um, the meanings. Because to do a khatam, you know, Everybody should try to do a khatam once, uh, once a month. The Qur'an was divided into 30 um, juz for a reason. Those juz are meant to be read. Hijran al-Qur'an, it's considered hijran if you read it less than twice a year, that you've pretty much abandoned it. So if you're only reading it once in Ramadan, you should at least try to do one throughout the year. The other thing to do, uh, if for those of, of, of you who are trying to memorize it, Focusing on whatever you're memorizing is equal. One of, one of the things, all of the Qur'an is, is the same in its equal weight that it's from Kalam Allah. I mean, obviously there's some verses and some things that, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the greatest verse in the, in, in the Qur'an is, is Ayat al-Kursi uh, because of the attributes of God that are embedded in that verse. But all of the Qur'an is Kalam Allah. So any, 
any Jews you read from, it's Kadam If you only read one Jews a day, but everybody should try. It takes, once you get used to it, it, it takes about 25 minutes uh, on average, 20 to 30 minutes to do. We waste a lot of time. There's a lot of people that watch a couple hours of television every day. Um, if you look on your cell phones, it's quite troubling to see the, type, the amount of time uh, that uh, we spend on the phone or on the uh, on the cell phone or looking at things people send us, those things. I mean, these are all things. So we should give give some time to Allah's book. Uh, it's it's just a stunning experience, really, to have continuous uh, connection with this book. And one of the things that I promise you, if you do it as a practice, over time, uh, it will it would just get stronger and stronger. In other words, you, you won't want to stop. So I think, and that's something all the people that have a strong relationship with the Quran, they experience. So I just, I recommend to the students here, don't do a lot of uh, other dhikrs, do, do the Quran. Don't, don't um, I, I think we need to get back to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to a foundational sunnah. Um, Imam Madika radiallahu wrote a book, the Muatta, it's the first major book in hadith. He, he has less than 800 hadiths of the Prophet's lies. And even though he knew over 100,000, he really put what he felt was absolutely necessary. Um, hadith tradition is for scholars. It's for ulama. It's not for common people. It was never meant to be read by common people. The hadith can really create an immense amount of confusion. And Ibn Wahbin, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, he's one of the rijal of Imam al-Bukhari. Ibn Wahbin said, I learned so many hadith, I became confused. And uh, because of the, the problems in the Hadith tradition. And he said, Had it not been for Layth and Imam Malik, Imam Layth and Imam Malik, these are two mushtahidun at that time. He said they were his te teachers. He said, I would have perished. Uh, Malik used to say, take this and leave that, take this and leave that. So Hadith is really not for uh, untrained people. Hadith is meant for scholars. It's meant to be read with commentary. In the same way the Quran should be read with, uh, with commentary. It's very dangerous um, to, to, just because you know Arabic, if you studied modern Arabic, the Quran is very subtle. There are many subtleties in the Quran. There are many subtleties in prepositions, in huruf, the fa, the wow. Um, for instance, uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَسُمُّنُكُمْ سُوءَ الْأَذَابِ you know, that Fir'aun, remember the blessing of Allah when he saved you from Fir'aun. And, and then it says, you know, he, 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 he gave you a horrible punishment. Wa, that wow there, wa, uh, you, he, he killed your, your sons and he took captive your women. That wow indicates that that's not the adab, the killing of the sons and the taking of the women, or, it, or, or, or it's more than just that. So those type of subtleties, it takes a long time um, to learn that. I mean, I've been studying Arabic for over 40 years now, and I, I really feel I'm just, it's, it's, it's an immense ocean of a language. I mean, I, I feel blessed that I'm able to read, I can read in tafsirs and the books of fiqh, and I had some really great scholars. But it's, it's really a lifelong study. And just when you've got it all, uh, at least, you know, I think it's time to go. So, on that note. Alhamdulillah. Last question? Last question. Barakallahu feek. Um, earlier, you touched on speaking truth to power. Any words on the suffering of the people of Yemen at the hands of other governments, which leaves me feeling powerless? How can we help? And mm -hmm. could you please close with a dua for this ummah? Yeah, uh, Yemen is a great tragedy of our time, among, amongst many others. Um, these are incredibly complicated situations uh, involving civil wars uh, between um, uh, Yemen's uh, uh, still a clan culture. so. You have tribes, you have cultures, you have different, they're, they're actually quite distinct cultures in Yemen, like Hadrami culture is different from al mukalla or Hadan or uh, Ib or, or, uh, or uh, 
uh, um, you know, the northern portion of Yemen. It was once actually two countries and they, they unified and now they're back uh, to uh, the civil war. And then obviously the, the neighboring countries got involved. You had uh, ISIS uh, or ISIS-like people, Al-Qaeda, Fil Jazeera, al Arab took over quite a large portion. So it's just, it's, it's the fog of war. It's a horrible situation. Uh, it's not easy to discern. It's very easy to point fingers at this, that, or the other. But in the end, these are fitan between Muslims. And we should just pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove these fitan uh, from these people. The Yemeni people, the Prophet sallallahu loved them. They were people that became Muslim without having to... Um, uh, Without, just by inviting them to Islam, they came. He said that al hikmah Yemani. He said that iman Yemani. Um, but there, there's also, unfortunately, in the whole Muslim world and here, everywhere, you know, Muslims have really departed from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, from his minhaj, and a lot of these things. If you read the Quran, it's very clear that the 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 Prophet says Sallallahu Alaihi said. Inna ummati ummatu marhuma. My ummah has, it's an ummah of God's mercy. And then he said, Ju'ila adabuha fi dunyaha. The punishment of my ummah is in this dunya. So we also have to recognize that when people divert and go far astray, from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and from the guidance that was given to us, and the the the, the sinfulness becomes widespread and open, um, that tribulations will afflict us. And in some ways, the places where these tribulations are the worst are the places where those people are closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. In other words, uh, that the, the, when Allah loves a people, He gives them tribulation to elevate them or to remove their sins. And so we, we, we should pray for our brothers and sisters, uh, do what we can. There's good uh, organizations that try to help. But right now, this is, it's the fog of war. We're in the midst of just a very tragic period for our ummah. Uh, we should do our best to pray. We should counsel the people that have the power to, to do what they can. Um, I think the kind of belligerent attitude and what's happening even for people that, you know, and I have, I have my own criticisms of uh, things in, in that region, but I would honestly say, you know, we should be praying for these people. We should not, this type of hatred that people have for um, these governments and things like that, we should be praying for them. Um, you know, it's, it's what comes without government is actually much worse than what what, whatever tribulations governments bring. When you remove these governments, when you have anarchy, this is the result of anarchy. We should be praying for these governments. Our Prophet ﷺ was somebody that he, he didn't, he, he didn't um, disrupt social systems. When he came into Mecca, إِنَّ الْمُرُوكِ إِذَا دَخَلُوا قَرِيَةً أَفْسَدُوهَا وَجَعَلُوا عَزَةَ أَهْلِهَا أَذِلَّهَ The kings you know, tyrants and king. when they come into places, they create these uh, horrible situations. But the Muslim, the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophets, they don't do that. The Prophet ﷺ, when he came into Mecca, he said, Man dakhala bayta Abi Sufyan, kana amina. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan will be safe. He took the Sayyid of, of the Quraysh, who had fought him for 20 years. And, and, he, and he maintained his dignity and honor because he wanted to win his enemies over. He, he, he wanted to win them over. Um, when he wrote to the Romans, Ila Alim al Rom, to the great one of, of Rome, Aslam Teslam, submit and, and find peace. Uh, when he spoke, uh, when his, if, if you want to see the best lesson in dealing with government, just look at how Ja'far spoke with uh, al Najashi. It's a stunning testimony to the hikmah, the wisdom of these people. Despite the fact that the Najashi, they were monophysites. Um, they were that actually a type of Christianity that believed in the divinity of Christ. But when Amr ibn al-As tried to get them into a difficult situation, the, the ayahs he quoted, he just left it 
uh, in a way where he didn't compromise his beliefs, but at the same time he didn't offend the beliefs of the of the of the ruler that he was um, uh, that they were guests of. And so, just getting back to this wisdom and trying to, you know, just everybody uh, is going to be judged by God. We're all going to be judged by God. Um, these rulers are going to be judged by God, and I, I don't envy any of them. Um, most of them don't sleep well. Uh, the type of burdens that they have, people think that Adafi changed palaces every night. Never, never had a good night's sleep. Many of them have to take drugs just to go to sleep. Um, so it's not something that you should envy, or and 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 we should just really pray for them. Our, our tradition, Imam Tahawi says, "La nadu alayhim." We don't imprecate against rulers. Um, we, we should pray for them. There's a lot of people that don't believe that anymore because we have a kind of re revolutionary Islam that wants to tear everything down as opposed to just recognizing we have to work with what we have and, and try to make it better. Um, so, but, uh, you know, everybody's doing their ishtihad and uh, Yom Al-Qiyam is going to be a good day. We're all going to see who's who on that day. We'll see who's who. Uh, it's better, I think, to wait. Wait, and I'll wait too with you. And we will see. Uh, so, we're all going to have to stand before God and be taken to account for our actions and for our lives. So, may Allah bless all of you, bless your Ramadan, increase you, elevate you. May He forgive. Uh, us, our transgressions, forgive our shortcomings. May He, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, uh, accept whatever prayers we've been able to put forward extra in this Ramadan, accept our recitation of Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, give us uh, visions of our Prophet in our dreams, and may, may, he, uh, may He make our Prophet pleased with us when He sees us at the hold, inshallah. May He Give us ease in our lives and ease. If there's anybody sick or depressed, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove your sickness or your depression. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you, elevate you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, forgive any of your transgressions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this book of, of, of Allah the spring of our hearts. May, may, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this book uh, something that we love and recite constantly and act accordingly uh, to. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, uh, uh, give right guidance to the people in power wherever they are. May, may he, uh, may he just. We ask you, Ya Allah, to anta salam wa tuhib salam, minka salam wa ilayka yaud salam, hayna rabbana bil salam, tabarakat wa taali tiyadan al jarari wa ikram. Your peace and you love peace and 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 so bring peace to to places where there's war. Uh, bring love to the places where there's hatred. Uh, bring unity to, to the places where there's division. Make us people of unity always. And we ask you to bless this Ramadan, inshallah, and, 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 and give us the blessing of Laylat al Qadr. And, 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 and inshallah, may you make uh, um, us see many Ramadans before we leave this world uh, going back to you in a pleasing state. Ya Arham al Rahimin, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, tisim kathira. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلم على المسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك آمين جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته